Happy Wednesday, church family. I'm so glad that you're joining with me for another Bible study as we're finishing off 1 John chapter 5. Before we begin, let us say a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for bringing us to another Bible study. I pray that you will lead us and guide us as we study your word so it may be able to know you better, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 until the end. Um, let us go ahead and just read chapter, uh, verse 14. It says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Now what an assuring thought. We often can feel that our prayers are not going beyond the ceiling. We can sometimes feel that because of who we are, what we've done, that Jesus does not hear. And John has been talking about the fact that he who abides in him does not keep on sinning. But that doesn't mean that he's talking about the fact that a Christian never sins. I believe what he's talking about here when it comes to this confidence, when he says, you know, you have life. A Christian may think, how can I have life, Lord, when... I have sinned against you, when I have hurt you. Even today, at this moment, I feel sorrow for the sin I have done. And I want, to, uh, I want you to know that I truly love you. And, and John understands this. And so he had actually addressed this fact about how when we speak to God, He hears us. When was the last time he talked about that? 1 John chapter 1. When he said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, John's trying to make sure his readers understand, yes, maybe you have failed. Maybe you have drifted away. You have believed those that said that Jesus Christ is not the Messiah, that he's not truly God. And you have uh, hated your brother and the relationships in your church and in your family have soured and you need to repent. And he's saying, yes, when we come to him, and that is God's will for you to come to him, for me to come to him and to confess our sin and to have faith and confidence that he hears me even in the midst of my wickedness, that if I would draw to him, that he will hear. You see, it's Satan's ploy to make us think that, look, you think you, because you read your Bible, you're so great, you've just sinned yesterday. You just sinned at this moment. He has spoken harshly. You have sinned with your mind, lust of the eyes. You're no good for heaven. God doesn't want you. Jesus doesn't care for you because you don't care for Him. So just stop. Stop trying to live for God. And John's trying to encourage his readers, look, you can have confidence that He who has life hears those who will come to Him in repentance and confess their sin. Because He is faithful to cleanse us and to forgive us. And of course, he continues in verse 15 saying, look, whatever we ask to him and we petition him, just know that he has those petitions and he hears them. And then he continues, if we, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give, he, that's God, will give that person life for those who commit sin not leading to death. Now, what is he talking about here? We know that it's not a particular sin per se, right? Just hear me out. Um, he's identifying the fact that when we don't come to confess our sin, well, then that sin is going to lead us to death because we have chosen to not come to the Lord in confidence to say, God, take this, forgive me of this sin that I have committed. And that's what really the unpardonable sin of uh, grieving the Holy Spirit is. Uh, Jesus says, you, uh, you can deny the Son, but cannot deny the Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit. Why? Because if we have gone so far that now we can no longer hear the voice of God because we have strayed so far, and we cannot bring ourselves to repentance because the Bible tells us God is the one that brings us to repentance, and we've hardened our own hearts for so long, then any sin can really lead us to death. Any sin that we continue to hold on to that draws us further and further away from God that we can no longer, as 1 John 1, 9 says, confess our sins because we don't see them. We don't feel them. We've become so hardened that our sin will now lead us to death. I hope that makes sense. And so John is saying, pray for those people. There's still an opening for that wayward child of yours as we continue to pray for that person that God's voice will still be heard by them, that they will have some small opening in their heart. Remember, God will not and cannot kick down the doors of our locked up homes of our hearts. He will stand at the door and knock. But if we have shut our doors and put soundproof walls all throughout the doors and the windows and the walls of our hearts, that we want to shut up our hearts and our ears to the uh, calling of the voice of God, then we have chosen our fate. We have chosen our end. We have chosen to not listen to the voice of God anymore. That is a sin leading to death. Um, And again, remember that John has been trying to balance this, uh, don't keep on sinning, but remember that you do sin. Why? One is, we will not live a sinful life if we are born of God. Why? Because we're going to put those things away. We're going to follow the commandments of God. But then he doesn't want his believers to now think that if I do commit a sin, then I must not be born of God. Being perfectionists. And then now believing that I will never, if I am truly with God, I will never ever commit a sin again. That can't be true because he says in 1 John 1, that if we say we do not have sin, then we are making God a liar. And that's why... Because we have sinned, we have to confess it to God. You see this kind of balancing act he's trying to play, people going to these extremes. And that's what he's saying in verse 18. He's doing this balancing. Hey church, don't think you can continue in your sin and live this sinful life and think you're born of God. As we flee from the devil, we will draw closer to the Lord. The Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We have to flee from the devil and draw near to God. And that is how we are kept from the wicked one. It is only God that can provide that protection. We don't look inward. We look without ourselves, outside of ourselves, because God is the only one that can keep us from the wicked one. Um, That's why the world, uh, he says, lies under the sway of the wicked one. They think they can handle it on their own. But the wickedness, the evil that is capable, that man is capable of, is astounding, is it not? And uh, John is making it clear, there are two powers. But he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So if you would draw near to God, the more and most powerful one, you will be kept safe from the wicked one. You won't be drawn by his influence. You won't be enticed by the things he has to offer because you have chosen to abide in God. I need to remind myself of that. Um, No matter how many sermons you preach, no matter how many people you serve in the community, no matter what you may do in your prayer life, It can often be daunting to think about the fact that I'm still a sinner. Lord, why can't I just be free from all the sin and never make a mistake, never uh, snap at my spouse, never uh, feel like you're not with me, Lord, never feel any stress because I've put all my trust in the Lord. But (laughs) it's not true of my life. But John is careful to remind me here, hey, whatever you ask of the Lord, He hears you. If you still have that heart to come to Him, to confess, He is there. And He will not leave you. Stay close to Him. 
He's reminding, John is reminding me, stay close to God. Draw near to God each and every day in what you do and how you live, how you spend your time. And slowly those things that enticed you before, uh, those allurements of the devil, will lose their power. They will lose their power. And um, that's why he ends off in verse 23 saying, Little children, keep yourself from idols. Jesus came, John says, that we may, may know the true God and eternal life. So keep yourself from idols. What are the idols in your life? What are the idols in my life that I need to identify? Those things that I keep going back to that uh, keep my heart from truly being given over to the Lord. It could be um, what John identifies in chapter 3 of his book about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Idols that we make, of our, make for ourselves, it could be uh, merchandise, commercial goods. It could be those shoes, a car, a house. It could be a career. We could idolize an education, thinking that that is what will draw us and bring us success. It could be um, a secret sin that we've been holding on to and we need to let go. Jesus came not to just give us a better life. He didn't come just to make us a little happier. He came that we would have life and life more abundantly. Not just here, but for eternity. He came that we'd have eternal life. One that would be free <laughs> from all that constrains us. Because the Bible tells us when He comes again, and He'll come quickly, but He will wipe away every tear. There will be no more death, no more crying, no more pain. Sin and sinners will be put to an end. What is the idol you need to let go of? Is there pride in your life that is keeping you from forgiving someone? Let go of that idol. Is it the uh, constant ambition to uh, further yourself in your career, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but one in which you have put ahead of taking time to read your Bible, taking your time to be with God's people in His church, taking time to pray. Chasing after the dollar takes a lot of time, and time is a limited resource. How are you spending it? Or is it the idol of a secret sin? Maybe it's a sin at a computer. Maybe it's the sin at work. Maybe it's a sin at your house. Break down the idols, John is saying, and find out what real life is like through the Son, through Jesus Christ. And then you'll know God more fully. And He who has an unending supply of riches and mercy and glory and grace will be there to surround you. Because the idol, it's not worth it. God has so much in store for us, but we throw them away for peanuts. We throw them away for crumbs. And John is saying in the book of 1 John, have faith in Jesus Christ. He will give you the victory in this life. Don't you want that victory? Don't you want to say and have confidence, Lord Jesus, come quickly. He says, even so I come because I have prepared a place for you that I want to take you to. May we be prepared by breaking down the idols, by knowing that Jesus is the Christ, by confessing our sin and acknowledging our Savior, by keeping the commandments of God which are not burdensome for us, and by loving God and loving our fellow man. May that be a part of our lives from this day on. Amen. Thank you for being with me through this journey as we studied the book of 1 John. I hope it was a blessing to you. It certainly was a blessing for me. And as we transition to studying another book, we're going to be taking 
a few weeks of a break and we'll join back together on June 22. If you have any suggestions for a book you would like to study, let me know in the comment section and maybe that'll be a book that we can go through together as a church family. God bless you and be with you and I'll see you soon.